My name is Joe Dalton, entrepreneur and business coach. Welcome to Breakthrough Brands. Each week, we bring you an inspirational story and an insight to the minds of some of the top business leaders, authors, and mentors from around the globe. Whatever is needed to make you shine in life and business, you'll find it here. On today's show, we have Dr. John Demartini. Dr. Demartini is considered one of the world's leading authorities on human behavior and personal development. He is the founder of the Demartini Institute, a private research and education organization with a curriculum of over 76 different courses covering multiple aspects of human development. His trademarked pathologies, the Demartini Method and the Demartini Value Determination are the culmination of 45 years of cross-disciplinary research and study. His work has been incorporated into human development industries across the world. Demartini travels 360 days a year to countries all over the globe, sharing his research and findings in all markets and sectors. He is the author of 40 books, published in 31 different languages. He has produced over 70 CDs and DVDs covering subjects such as development and relationship, wealth, education and business. Each program is designed to assist people to activate leadership and empower themselves in all seven areas of their lives. Financial, physical, mental, vocational, spiritual, family and social. And welcome to Break Two Brands. On today's show, we have Dr. D. Martini. Dr. D. Martini, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me to your show. I'm delighted to have you. Um, I probably know you well from The Secret and from your YouTube clips that uh, I think the world is checking when they're looking for some educational information on human behavior. I think you're the number one top dog. Well, I keep a busy schedule on it. I'm very blessed by... Uh what I love doing, so I, I can't complain. Tell me, what's your greatest achievement? Well, I think the greatest achievement that I've been blessed to do is to uh, develop uh, some methodologies that appear to be helping uh, millions of people, um, not only resolving emotional challenges, but also being clear and concise in their values of what they'd love to do, and also in helping people um, deal with grief and loss and and help them also be really focused and and and, you know inspired by their life so there's anything to do with maximizing human awareness potential i've been blessed to contribute and and watching lives change is probably the most significant thing that i think is my achievement watching lives change yeah i think we're all an open book in a way and we evolve all the time I know you talk about spirituality, you talk about mind development, career, financial goals, family, social and health. Which one of them would you feel is the biggest problem for a lot of people or is it a mixture of all? Yeah, it's a mixture because in any one day, t- today for instance, I've already worked with somebody with a health problem, um, somebody with a relationship problem, somebody with a business problem already this uh, today in consulting. So I, I think that each person, based on their own individual values and needs, will have different challenges. And sometimes it'll rotate around in a person's life. You may have your finances finally in order, and then a relationship can be challenged. Then you challenge a relationship can be in order, and then you might have a health issue. So it moves around. But uh, business and finance, a lot of males have this, and relationships, a lot of females have this still as, as, a, as sort of a common one. But I think it could go in any area. I, I've tried my best to uh, learn as much as I can in each of the primary areas of life to be able to offer services to assist people. And, um, you know, it's a, an ongoing thing. I've been doing it 45 years. So it's an ongoing growing process. I hope to learn every day. I think you never stop learning because you meet new people and you they open up your mind and it makes you wonder about something that happened a year ago or a year before it's it's like myself I love knowledge I probably read a book a week I'm always learning I'm always interested in in what people have to say and this show as well gives me that opportunity and in in those five stage or seven stages that you have I think you're right a lot of people that I come across and especially male is business and finance and in your consulting do you just get people to be aware 
and teach them how to go to the next step in trusting themselves or is there a system that you use to get them to go from point A, say, to point Z? Well, in businesses, um, there's a number of tools and methods that I, I guess I've you know, accumulated over the years, toolkit. Uh, one thing that I found really valuable that I think most every business person can uh, appreciate is to sit down and write down every single thing that they do in a day, literally everything they do in a day, both professionally and personally, Okay. and make an exhaustive daily action list, not projects that they're working on, but the daily actions that they do in a day, what's most consistently they do in a day. Uh, consistently means they may take, they may look at a whole month and take all the actions they may do in a month, but put them in because they could be doing any one of those in one day. Once they've exhausted that list, Next to that, you put down next to it in a column next to it in a five column sheet. Uh, how much does it produce per hour? What does it actually produce as far as an income per hour? Because that means you're serving somebody with it and earning an income. But what what does it actually produce? And by looking at that and being an honest extrapolator of what it is per hour, and sometimes you may spend 10 minutes on it, have to multiply it times six or maybe two hours on it, divide by half. You try to figure out what it is so you can look at where you're majoring in minors and minoring in majors because many people, without realizing it, are not really doing the most meaningful, highest priority, most inspiring and productive things each day. And they're trapped in habits uh, and they're not learning the art of delegating. And so they're, they're trapped and they devalue themselves in the process in business. The third one is how much meaning does it have? A third column. How much meaning on a one to ten scale? Does this actually provide? Because sometimes you'll sacrifice something that's productive for a little bit meaningful and vice versa. And the next column is how much does it produce? How much would it cost per hour to delegate that, to hire somebody to do that to the same standard, including every cost, not just their salary cost, but every cost, their space cost, their depreciative um, item cost, everything. And then the last column is how much time is spent. And if a person will do, go through those five columns, um, and then go back and really answer those thoroughly and as honestly as they can. It'll give them a great insight on where they're majoring in minors and minoring in majors and what to be actually structuring as priority and what to be delegating. And if they can't delegate things, they'll trap themselves. As time, as the Time Trap book said by Alec McKenzie, if you don't know the art of delegating, you're going to trap yourself. And if you're not doing the highest priority things that produce the most, which raise your self-worth, and get your blood glucose and oxygen into the executive center of the brain where you are most visionary, most strategic, and most executive, and most self-governed, you're not going to live to the fullest potential, and you're not going to produce the most income that you can afford to delegate with. So it's important to prioritize what's truly important, not what you just fantasize about, and not, not honestly reflect at how you're spending your time, because most people can extract valuable time out of their day if they prioritize. I could say with a lot of businesses, they... They have their full day, but a lot of that day is they spend just kicking the can around, doing something, thinking they're busy, but not actually achieving anything. Well, anytime you're doing high priority things and high value things, you raise your self worth. And anytime you're doing low priority ones, you lower self worth. Yeah. So if you're beating yourself up, it's because you're doing low priority things and then you're getting in the way thinking you're the only one that can do it or thinking that by the time they've done it, I could have done it, this kind of thing. And it traps you. If you're not filling your day with high priority actions that inspire you, your day is going to fill up with low priority distractions that don't. One raises self worth, one doesn't. And if you're not filling your day with challenges that inspire you, that create you stress and vitality, you're going to end up with challenges that don't, which create distress and drain you. And it's such a, a an important component is to be honest with reflection and self inspection enough to look really truly at what you're doing. And many people go through habits and never question themselves. And um, then blame things on the outside because they're reflecting what they're doing to themselves on the inside. Yeah, it, it probably a habit could be a, a three-year cycle or a seven-year cycle, and they're always ending up at point zero again. It, it's what I say to a lot of companies or people that I would consult with. If you're doing some work, ask yourself the question, the work that I'm doing now, is this paying me an income or can I delegate it to someone else? Especially if they're in that, say, mode that they need help with and they kind of go yeah that's right and by asking that question it helps them get to the next step as well you also mentioned as well 
uh, take everything as a blessing. I'm, I'm very spiritual myself. I, I get up in the morning. I do some meditation. I'm grateful during the day. I have a lot of gratitude. How does someone feel if they're facing bankruptcy and see that as a blessing? Well, it, if they're doing bankruptcy, that means somehow they're not either caring enough about customers and, and humanity to meet the true needs. Because when you're meeting true needs, uh, there's a demand. So if you're pushing your business uphill and trying to make it profitable when you're not actually meeting the needs, somehow you're narcissistically assuming what the world needs instead of finding out what the world needs. And it forces you to humble yourself and forces you to really truly get in touch with what people need and make sure you deliver a product, service, or idea that people need and not what you think they need. And it also forces you to be accountable on and not live in kind of la-la land about what actual costs are. So it forces you to get detailed and 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 uh, get in there and find out what your real costs are. And it also forces you to value yourself to say, hey, I need to make sure I have a cushion and let, let, plenty of capital before I put myself in this position. So it's, a, it's an educational process and it doesn't necessarily mean failure. It just means feedback. And it's gui guiding you to do that. And and if you go back and find the blessings of it and find out how it's guiding you to become a greater business person, you can use it as a catalyst instead of as a drain. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. And how does someone know if they're ready down for the next stage? Well, my experience is when they do prioritize what they do, um, they automatically, by relinquishing and properly delegating, and this is the key, if you delegate to people that are looking up to you and not specialists that are greater in what they do than you, you're going to end up uh, micromanaging and distracting yourself and wondering why things aren't working. But if you surround yourself and pay the difference and get quality people that can take you and elevate you, it liberates you from their management to on to going on to visionary activities that take you to the next level. So you have to be able to not be the hero in the business, but to be the person who's the visionary caring about people and making sure you surround yourself with people that really love what they do so they're engaged so you don't have to micromanage and, and keep an eye on them all the time. If you're having to oversee people all the time, you probably hire people that are, you know, D, C, C, D, E, F, G people instead of A, B, C people. What about then coming up to fear of failure or fear of success? Do they all fit into that same box or are they? Well, I've never seen a fear of success in my, in my entire history. I've seen what happens is if they feel that they're going to get ahead in their business, they're concerned about their it's what an impact it's going to have on their relationship, or they're concerned about what people will think if all of a sudden they become very prosperous, and they fear of rejection of people. They fear that it may not have the energy or the vitality. It may affect their health. I've not seen a fear of success. I've seen a fear of other aspects of life. There's seven basic fears. The fear of not knowing enough, the fear that you might fail, the fear that you might not make money or you might lose money, the fear that you might lose loved ones, the respect of loved ones, the fear that you might get rejected by somebody, the fear you know, of ill health, death, or disease, or not having the vitality, uh, the fear of somehow breaking some morals and ethics or some authority outside yourself. These are the fears that I find surface. And when I go to a person that thinks they have success fears, I usually find it's one of those other fears combined. We talk sometimes here about the imposter syndrome. Would that fit in there as well? Well, if you're playing a role, you know, there's nothing more magnificent than the true you. Yeah. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Im, you know, imitation, envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. And many people live in the shadows of others instead of standing on the shoulders of giants. I find that what I, one of the exercises I teach in my signature program, The Breakthrough Experience, is I have people go and I t have them identify the most powerful people in the various fields they want to master. Okay. Then I have them go and identify what are the traits, the actions, the inactions that they do, that they display, that they admire most and dislike most. And then I have them go and own those traits by looking in their life where they display and demonstrate them until they're quantitatively equal, until they're surprised they discover them. And then they level the playing fields and they give permission for them to stand strong in their own mission instead of trying to be somebody they're not. So often people are trying to compare themselves to others instead of comparing their daily actions to their own dreams. Yeah, it's like, don't meet your heroes because you'll be disappointed. 
<laughs> well, the, the truth is they're just human beings like you, but you may have exaggerated them and you've minimized you. Yeah. As Einstein said, if you're a cat and you expect to swim like a fish, you're going to beat yourself up. Yeah, definitely. If you're a fish and you expect to climb a, climb a tree like a, a cat, you're going to beat yourself up. But if you honor yourself as who you are, you'll excel. Tell me this. If someone, say, wants to step into the limelight and wants to be a speaker or wants to, you know, show the world that they're an influencer, how did you go about doing it? I'm sure, you know, as you were a chiropractor, you kind of changed the sales and went a different direction. Was it? Did you just wake up one day and go, you know, I'm really good at speaking. I'm really good at understanding human behavior. This is the path I'm going to take. No, when I was 17 years old, I, I wrote down my first mission statement that I wanted to travel the world, step foot in every country in the face of the earth, and study teaching, healing, and philosophy. And I chose chiropractic as the healing art. I taught before I went into professional school. I taught while I was in undergraduate. I taught through professional school. I taught many of the classes I took while I was in professional school. I taught when I opened up my practice. I grew one of the biggest practices because of lecturing. I then lectured around in conferences to health professionals and more health professionals and then other industries and it kept growing. And I realized that I would be trapping myself in a clinic and not making the difference that I wanted to make. But I knew I was gonna be involved in healing but not full time and not forever. So that was a long term plan that had been mapped out way in advance. I knew that I wanted to travel the world and do what I'm doing today since I was 17. I've been doing it 45 years. I'm sure you could write a lot of books as you have on, on your, have you wrote one on your journey? As in your bio. I have a 4,000 page document that's my journey, actually. And I update it every single day. It's like a biography, a pictorial biography, and gratitude journal, and gold journal all in one, and a posthumous biography. And I keep metrics of everything I say I want to do and make sure I'm accomplishing them. It's a massive 4,000 page document that I'm sure that someday when maybe my kids will appreciate or somebody out there might read. But it's mainly for me along the journey. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating. I'd say there's a lot of people out there who would like to get their hands on it. I have a lot of students that love reading it. It, it brings a lot of tears of inspiration when they read it. it. inspires them to want to do more master planning for themselves. I'm sure it's a question that you get asked along the way, and I want to get into spirituality, but did the, the secret... Did it lift your business up or did it make you more aware internationally of who you were? I, I think I was speaking about 280 to 290 speeches a year when The Secret came out um, and traveling already. So that was already part of the agenda. Um, when The Secret came out, it, it did go up. It spiked. But a lot of them were little bitty presentations. They were not necessarily bigger presentations. Uh, you know, because wherever I went, people would say, oh, can you quickly do something here and there? So I would sometimes do three or four little things in a day. But I um, then it went back down and it's right now between 300 and 350, usually speeches a year. And I do about a thousand interviews a year. So I, I keep a pretty good schedule before the secret, during the secret and still after the secret. But it did have a spike, not not a vast spike, but about I think the highest point was about an 11 percent increase. A busy man, a busy man indeed. You're in London at the moment as well, aren't you, for a couple of days? I'm in London till tomorrow. I'm, I'm in Las Vegas on um, Wednesday night because I have to speak there. And I'm here tonight speaking. And then I'm, um, I'm, and I'm in, for the weekend, I'm in Las Vegas doing, I do four speeches there. And then I'm off to South Africa and I have tour there. So I'm constantly traveling and I love speaking. I love researching. I, I research in between every time I'm speaking and or I'm doing consulting or interviews. So I, I'm, a, I'm kind of a, I guess you could say a man on a mission. Where's your favorite place? You know, I've said that the universe is my playground. The whole world is my home. Every country is a room in the house and every city or so is a platform to share my heart and soul. So I, I feel at home everywhere I go. I live on a ship called the world, which has come into Dublin many times. And uh, so I just travel around the world either on my ship if I'm not flying. It's like we all have a favorite place in our own house where we can can go as well. So yeah, I live in a big friggin' house. It's called Earth. Earth, yeah. <laughs> I traveled. I traveled around on aircraft carriers many many years ago. I was on the Carl Vincent, which had nine thousand people on it, which was a, a floating village. When I was working with Chrysler Corporation, so uh, that was an interesting place to be. That was a ship. Yeah, well, that's uh, it. wasn't quite as probably as luxury as the one we have, but it's it's it was probably scenic in the sense you get to see the world. You get you do you do. I'm just going to take a short break. Are you looking to boost your performance? 
motivate your sales team, have an all-round structure to your marketing, get in touch with myself at Breakthrough Brands or contact me at joe at jdc.ie. Intuition. Very intuitive myself. I, I sort of cl- try and find out and use a, an inner being to see if it can help me with my guidance. But I think a lot of people have switched off from it and there's a lot of noise that goes in and out and they they can't really pick up on the divine. Have you any way of helping people or saying to people, look, it is there, you just need to tap into it and how do they tap into it? Well, okay, let me develop that a second because yeah. I definitely work with that. Uh, let's say that you're a, a single guy and you meet this beautiful girl and you're quite enamored and you're even infatuated and be, based on your values, you perceive more advantages and disadvantages, more pleasures and pains, more positives, negatives, more gains and losses by being around her and you're a bit infatuated and blind to the downsides. So you're conscious of the upsides but unconscious the downsides. And you have a little bit of a fatal attractor like Michael Douglas and Glenn Close had. And then you eventually discover days, weeks, months, or years, this person has the other side that you didn't see initially. Now your intuition was whispering to you initially, but you didn't listen to it. So you're temporarily impulsively blind by your animal passion, but your intuition was trying to whisper to say, hey, there's two sides of the girl, get real, get grounded, get realistic, get objective. But you didn't listen initially because the the passion were a little stronger than the intuition. Then you may turn that same person into somebody you resented later, and now you're seeing the drawbacks more than the benefits, the negatives more than the positives, the pains more than the pleasures, the losses more than the gains, and now you're conscious of the negatives and unconscious of the positives that you once were attracted to. And now your intuition is trying to point up there's meaning and there's purpose of why you're with this person. They're trying to teach you something. Your intuition is always trying to bring the ignored unconscious part to the surface So the conscious and unconscious can be joined together in a full conscious state, which is inspired or spiritual. I call it the state of unconditional love or the soul. So you're most spiritual, not when you're listening to intuition, but when your intuition has taken you to the center and you've integrated the unconscious and conscious and now become fully conscious and inspired and spiritually there. So the intuition is always trying to, as a negative feedback system and like an entangled particle in physics, trying to bring the particle and antiparticle, the unconscious and conscious into oneness so you have full consciousness full awareness which is always something graceful and something inspired to when you get to the truth and is that when you feel the most happiest and feel alive that's when you feel the most fulfilled fulfilled i won't say happy because happy can be misconstrued by some people hedonistically but i felt call it fulfillment when you're filled with both sides See, anything you infatuate with occupies space and time in your mind and runs you anything you resent occupies space and time in your mind and runs you But when you see them in perfect balance, synchronously, you feel gratitude and love. And now instead of the world on the outside running you, the voice and the vision on the inside guides you. And this is that sixth sense that Napoleon Hill describes that gives the competitive advantage in the markets. Because here you have equanimity and objectivity and you have the ability to have equity with your clients and maintain fair exchange and sustainable relations with people. This is what allows you the advantage in the world. But yeah, a lot of people just live on the five cents, but you have the six. But what's happened is, and I think it's ingrained, is it's built into your DNA or from your parents or your grandparents or your great grandparents is fear and doubt that creep in to the mind and stop people believing in their intuition. Anytime a person sets a goal that's not really a goal, but it's a fantasy, it's not objective. That means you haven't thought out all the downsides and mitigated the risks and prepared. You're designed to have a doubt and fear. And anytime you set up a fantasy that's one-sided and you're not really real about it, or anytime you're setting a goal that's not really congruent with your highest value and who you really are, you're designed to have self-depreciation and doubt as a feedback to let you know you're setting goals that aren't true and not balanced and not real and not strategized and not chunked into small enough bites. And the moment you put those in operation, the, the anxiety, the fear, and the doubt disappear. Okay, so it's it, it's like a thermometer or a test to see where you are and for you to kind of go back to the drawing board and make sure you exactly. get it right. Exactly. It's a feedback. It's a negative feedback system homeostating you onto the truth of what you're committed to. And many people compare themselves to others, inject the values of others, cloud the clarity of what they really want, set goals that aren't really, really theirs. They think it is. 
But then when they actually go after it, they wonder why they can't stay focused. They keep, quote, sabotaging. But really what it is is they're going back to what is important. They just don't know what's really important in their life. They think it is. Uh -huh. I've asked people by the thousands how many want to be financially independent, and all the hands go up. I can stand in front of 10,000 people, 10,000 hands will go up. And then I said, how many of you are financially independent? 9,990 hands will go down. <laughs> And I'll say, well, then you obviously have somebody here has some fantasies because only 1% or less of the population obtain it. So what you do is you're having a fantasy of the lifestyles of the rich and famous. You really want to spend money on the lifestyle, not really actually learn about objective asset accumulation, which is boring to some people. So what they do is they th think they want finance, but they really just want to spend the money of the, li the rich lifestyle. They don't really run to buy assets and make sure they learn the art of accumulating money so it's working for them. They work their whole life for money instead. Or they don't know how to. Exactly. They're, well, that's because they don't value it. They think they do, but they don't really value it. The hierarchy of one's values will determine their financial destiny. Yeah, yeah. You've given me a bit to think about there. The, it's, it's interesting because talking about fear and doubt and – if you, you know, say you're doing something and it's cricking in you and you're not feeling it and it's not passionate to you, you should kind of go, hold on, take a step back here and do something that you want to do. Well, if you're not doing something you're loving to do and you're not filling your day with things that are meaningful, you're designed to break down and have all those anxieties as a feedback to let you know you're being inauthentic. You're yeah. being unintegral. Yeah, it's it's like I love doing the radio. I I absolutely adore it. I get to speak to people like yourself, and you know, every week, and it's something that I'm very passionate about, um, and it's something that will grow for me hopefully as well. So, well, that's me. I I love researching, writing, traveling, and teaching. The rest of everything is delegated away. I don't cook. I haven't cooked since I was 24. I haven't driven a car in 27 and a half years. I I do what I love to do, and I delegate the rest away. Yeah, no, I, I, I do like my cars and I do like my cooking. Where, where can people actually locate yourself? Where can they find your information or your courses? If you can share those details with the audience, it would be absolutely brilliant. Well, the, the easiest way to locate me is just go to my website, drdmartini.com, D-R-D-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-I.com. And on there is just a plethora of information. I mean, Hundreds and hundreds of interviews, uh, inspired writings, uh, products, uh, uh, the events calendar, where we're speaking around the world. Lots of things that can keep them busy on there. Plus, there's YouTube and all the social medias. But I'm just constantly you know, traveling full time around the world and um, doing what I love doing, which is researching, writing, traveling, teaching. But they can find out where I am by going on there. And um, what's, what's the future for you, Dan? Well, I hope to continue to do this as long as this little body keeps working. You know, I'm almost 64 now, so I'm I'm uh, I'm just been doing it all these years, and I I love doing it. So, as long as that body is going to run, I'll probably be doing this. I'll just keep doing it. I I haven't reached every country. I've been to 140 countries. I haven't been to all the countries yet, and I've still had a dream of going to every country around the world. So, I'll just keep lecturing and keep doing it. And I, I watch the opportunities open up every single day. Today, they in in Latin America, they want to publish some books and promote the methods into throughout Latin America. So that's an, and then we got something in Tokyo and Japan where they 20 universities want to use the values application. So that's that's all happened just today. So I have lots of things that I can be grateful for. Keeps happening. You're a young man at heart. I think so. I I um, you know I, I I guess a lot of people don't think I'm as old as I I am. But no, I thought you were in your uh, mid 50s. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm still going, but I I don't know. I just it's what I love doing, so I just do it. I, I I think that everybody deserves to do what they love and love what they do on a daily basis. I to me, there's there's no way you can convince me you can't structure your life in a way that that can happen. It's all that good sea air that's keeping you young and fit. <laughs> So if someone then wants to step out of their day-to-day -day normal routine, are you, do you think they should just write, make a plan that feels passionate to them and go with it and life and divine or spiritually things will take place and let it happen for them? No, I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want them to jump out there without a fishing net. Uh you know, and just go, well, somehow the universe will take care of me. I think that's a little bit uh, unwise. Yeah. I think they need to sit. I always say with people, start with what you know and what your life demonstrates. See, 
people come to me almost every week in the Breakthrough Experience, which is my signature program, which I've done 1,126 times. And they say to me, they say, well, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what to do, you know. And I go, look at your life. Every decision you make is based on what you believe will give you the greatest advantage or disadvantage at any moment in time according to what you value most. And every perception, decision, and action you take is based on those values. So look at your life. It tells you what's important to you. And if you're spending time and you you're love working with your kids and spend time with your kids, then don't set up a fantasy that you're going to be a big business person when your heart is into your kids. And if you love your business and you are an entrepreneur and you can't get it out of your mind, don't live in a fantasy that you're going to do something other than what you do. You got to get real and set real goals in real time that are aligned with real values and structure things that you know you don't let yourself down on and build from that. Start with what you know with certainty and build from that and let what that is grow Baby and start steps. structuring and planning with foresight. Use foresight and mentorship and planning. We go farther than if we live through hindsight and trial and error and we basically just gamble. That's speculative. I want to basically help people get really clear on what they do and help them redefine it. And I've not found one person that can't do that when asked the right questions. Because the quality of our lives is based on the quality of the questions we ask. And if we ask outrageously inspiring questions, we end up with an outrageously inspiring life. What's the best business advice that you've ever received? Well, you know, I would say to, I, I met with a guy named uh, from Drake International, Bill Pollock. He founded that in 1951. He said to me, you know, 1951 is the last day I ever went to work because when I founded my company, I finally found out what I love doing. And since then, it hasn't feel like any work. So I fi figure that, you know, either go and do what you love through delegating or go love what you do through linking by finding out what you're doing, how it's temporarily on the way until you can actually master plan what you want to do. And don't be don't be upset about what job you're in. See it is on the way. See it, how it's helping you gain the skills and the 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 ideas and the information you need in order to move forward. And 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 I'm a firm believer that if you're not following something that truly inspires you, you're, you're going to have a, a desperate life. And I, it's, it's silly. It's not totally unnecessary in the world today. I can understand why you are asked to go around the world and speak to people and do lectures. You're very inspiring. Well, I, I love what I do. And I, I think that I was blessed when I was 17 years old. I nearly died. I was a high school dropout. I had never even read a book from cover to cover. I was told in first grade that I would never be able to read, write, communicate, never mount thing, never go very far in life. And I nearly died. And one night, one man in one hour with one message absolutely inspired me, just absolutely inspired me with a message who made me believe that I could overcome my learning problems, learn how to read and someday be a teacher. And I knew I wanted to travel the world and I set out a dream and I mapped it out from that point on with his help. I mapped out what I wanted to do, and I never gave up on it. Excellent. When you find something you're absolutely inspired to do, you don't have to be motivated. I don't need motivation. No, you just you're inspired it. from within. Yeah, totally. And that's where I think most people, they, they feel trapped in dead-end jobs or they want to do something else, but they have the fear uh, of doing it. And once you get into passion or something that you're excited about, you, you look up and you realize the time has flown and you don't realize it because you're having fun doing it. Well, the thing is, if your vocation is not your vacation, you got a schizophrenia, you got a Monday morning blues, a Wednesday hump days, a thank God it's Fridays and a week friggin' end. Yeah. That's not how to live your life. No, not at all. What book would you recommend for someone to read? Well, you know, I, I've read thousands of books, uh, 30,100 and something books in my life. Uh, it depends on their objectives. If it's purely business, you know, I think Jim Collins knocked a lot of it out of the ballpark. I think he did a great job. But I think that almost every book you can pick your hands on in business, you're going to get at least one, some idea out of that book. I mean, I've read all the management books, and they are all been valuable to me. I can't think of any one that I didn't learn something out of. But I think good old Napoleon Hill's uh, success, the, the, you know, the what do you call it, the laws of success is a great little starting point for people. Yeah. Some basic principles there. The I think principles. Jim Collins did a great job on business savvy. And I, I'm a firm believer in, in, you know, making sure that you have sustainable, fair exchange with people. That's the only thing that's going to last. And if someone was, say, listening to this and they went, OK, this guy makes sense. And I know that you have published an awful lot of books. Where do, would you recommend them to start? Well, in my book series, I think probably The Values Factor, which is probably the most uh, important book that I've written recently, 
And because what it's doing is it's basically helping people get really clear on what's really is important and how to structure their life so they can empower all areas of their life according to these values instead of against them. And I think that's a significant book. And I don't know if anybody's read that that didn't go, thank you. Most people who read that go, thank you, as insightful. I read Lisa Nichols' book there over the Christmas. That was very inspiring, a woman that I, was down I saw out. her last, last week, actually. Last uh, Saturday, I saw her. Okay. Um, yeah, I speak to her on LinkedIn. She's uh, very inspiring as well. She's a lot of energy, a lot of energy yeah, as well. We, we spoke at a conference in Los Angeles, Jack Canfield and she and I and uh, Michael Beckwith, we all spoke at a conference together. So uh, last Saturday. I've asked her to come on the show. So it's, uh, we're, we're gearing that way. She's got a lovely story and she's a very inspiring woman. She is indeed. Like yourself, Dr. D. Martini. we're coming to the end of the show and I would like you to pick a song of what we can play out with and why you're picking that song. Well, I, I have a song, if you can find it on the internet, it's called John's Song. It's actually my song. John's Song, it's it's the first of the two called John's Song, if you find it on there. I don't know if you can look it up real quick. But it's it's about gratitude and love. And it's a, it's a great message for almost anybody in the world. So that's the song. I, I, I It's my favorite song because it's a song that I get to share a message in. It's an inspiring song if you if you played it. I, I think people love it because it's it's an inspiring song about being appreciative and learning to love and loving yourself. Before we wrap up, have you anything to add? Would you like to share a message with anybody out there? Yeah, that uh, whoever's listening out there, you want to give yourself permission to do something extraordinary on Earth. Because the truth is, that's who you are. The facade, the cover-up, the mask, the personas that you might wear, might not believe it, but the real true you is a magnificent being. And the magnificence of who you are is far greater than any fantasies you might impose on yourself. So give yourself permission to do something extraordinary. Give yourself permission to shine, not shrink, and to do what you really love in life. And don't let your life go by and have the five basic regrets at the end of the world. You're going to be asked at your end of your life, did you do everything you could with everything you're given? You want to be able to say, absolutely, I did something extraordinary because I'm an extraordinary person. So give yourself permission to do something extraordinary on planet Earth. That's the message. That's it. I say that to myself most days when I'm doing some work. I kind of go, what will I say when I'm, when I'm on my deathbed? And it does help me, drive me to, to get to the next level sometimes. Dr. John Martini, thank you for being on Breakthrough Brands. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be and share with your audience and, and be interviewed by your articulate self. Thank you very much. And I must say, uh, the next time you're in Dublin, if you give me uh, a tinkle, I would love to meet up and have yes, a bite Yes, I'm going to be there you. in May, it looks like. Excellent, excellent. Or Good June, pardon me, June. I, I think it's June. I'm, I'm in there. It's June. I think I'll be there. The weather gets better as the year goes on here. August yes. is the best time of the year. <laughs> yep. Thank you for coming on, and we'll chat soon. Thank you very much. I have so many things that I love to share with people. Let neither support or challenge interfere with pursuit of mission. For in fact, you need both to obtain your destiny. If you get over-supported and protected, you never grow and mature. But every challenge that you may have labeled terrible has a hidden benefit. Do not wait a day, a week, a month, a year, or five years later to discover that in the crisis there's a blessing. I know some people that think they're too big or too small or too short or too tall. But you have been given a body that is perfect for your mission. The moment you realize that and have gratitude for that is the moment your body takes you to new heights.
This show was sponsored by Harris Myers, your sales and marketing agency, helping you develop a better sales and marketing pipeline.